So uh, Michaelis uh, Zinterakis uh, will do our next presentation. And um, here's the clicker. Okay. Yep. And he, he is a senior associate with Cambridge Systematics and a lecturer at Rutgers University. His field of expertise includes data anal analysis and visualization, as well as travel demand modeling and simulation. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, the visualizations that I'm about, that I'm about to, uh, to show you today, they're not for the uh, general public. So if you show them in a dashboard, uh, nobody will understand them. So every time I show them, people are telling me, like, you know, you have a lot of explaining to do. Uh, so they're called high dimensional visualization. And high dimensional visualization is an active field in uh, computer science and machine learning. And these type of visualizations are very popular um, uh, for medical or bio biomedical um, uh, research applications and even simulation and other computer science topics. Uh, just to give you a very quick preview of how they look like in our field, okay, things like that, like that, or like that. So in order to get into there, I have to start from the very beginning and uh, tell you what are they about? So, in a high dimensional visualization, you just visualize the entire data set, meaning the entire data table. You just don't take any two variables to do a scatter plot. You just take the entire data table and you may have five variables, five columns, 50 columns, uh, 500 columns, or 5,000 columns, and then the algorithm projects all the data into a plane. So, why do you do that? Because doing this way, in many other fields, helps you to uncover structure in the data. So you see the clusters, you see the outliers, you find the days that are very different than the other days in the system, okay? Now, the problem with these visualizations, which haven't been applied that many times in our field, is very hard to interpret, okay? Because they're not intuitive and then they break down many of the assumptions that we do. So, uh, <clears throat> so when you have lots of data, you can start uh, doing histograms as scatter plots for any two variables, but if you have uh, 50 variables or 150 variables or 1,000 variables, this will take you forever. Um, when you have a small amount of data, you can use multiple encoding, so you can use color, you can use shape, uh, you can use position in order to, multi to visualize a number of variables, usually no more than five and six. There are other visualizations called parallel coordinates that can help you visualize at the same time, so say something like, 10 or 15 variables to understand the relationships. And multiple visual displays is just uh, using multiple displays of the uh, frequently used visualizations such as uh, scatter plots. So high dimensional visualizations apply some specific algorithms for machine learning that, as I said, take the, take the data and then project them to a plane. So this is a, what they call a new pulse problem. So it's not easy to do so. Uh, and interpretive result is not always intuitive. So we'll just go through a number of case studies that uh, can demonstrate the potential of those techniques. So the goal of the high dimensional visualization is to present the high dimensional data, which is like I have 50 columns, 150 columns, 10,000 columns, in the two dimensional map that preserves similarity between the points, clusters, and outliers. So you want to uncover the, 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 the structure in the data in this two dimensional map. And you should interpret this not as any previous visualization, visualization that you have, but as a new, as a new, as a, me, as a new type of uh, visualization. Okay. So let's start with a three-dimensional problem. Uh, so what's this three-dimensional problem? So these are positions of cities on the globe. So the globe is almost spherical, and uh, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to uh, take any number of cities in the, on the globe and then project them on a the plane. So we know already that's, a very, that's an impossible problem to solve. They have, uh, in the last 200, 300 years, there have been uh, hundreds of projections from uh, spherical data to the plane, on the plane that maintain certain attributes, such as distance of this area, okay? But this, uh, this time, I will use the, these uh, algorithms in from machine learning to project the points, okay? And the results actually is not going to be as good as the specific projections that we are aware of uh, and use, such as the Mercator projection. But let's let's start. So what I have here is I take from a number of European cities, 
the European countries, the five most populous cities. All right, I calculate for all those cities the distances between them, and then I use a linear method called my multidimensional scaling to project those, those uh, cities on the plane. So on the left, left hand, hand side, you see the map. On the right hand side, you see what the multidimensional projection uh, did. So more or less, it projected the points where they should be. So it, it maintained the distances between the cities. Okay, uh, it may not be as accurate as the left one, but it's pretty good enough and helps it, and help you understand what's the global distribution of the points. Okay, so let's do something a little bit uh, uh, harder. But before that, let's talk a little some about insights. So from point proximity on the map is point pro uh, is point similarity in the high dimensional space. So the, the points that are closer on the map are also closer in the three dimensional space. Okay, which is the sphere. All right? So distances on the map are proportional to the high dimensional distances. Uh, actually, uh, these are stochastic methods. So every time you run the projection, you may get a map that is oriented differently. What you should be looking at is the uh, distances between the points, the similarity between the points, and not the orientation. Okay? So let's now do something a little bit harder. So we have uh, a number of countries. USA, Japan, Brazil, South uh, Africa, Australia. We take the five most uh, popular cities of those, of those, uh, from those countries, and then again we use a linear projection on the dimensional scale to project on the plane. <clears throat> so this is a very, very, it's not, it's a very, very hard problem because uh, you have points on a sphere, you project on the, the plane, you cannot actually maintain the distances. But let's see what the projection gave us. So. It has a bundle there for Europe. Then you can see US, uh, the five cities in the US, some cities upright for Japan. And then you have Australia, uh, South Africa at the bottom, and then Brazil. So there are actually quite a few errors there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> for example, the distance from New York to Rio de Janeiro is actually a little bit smaller than the distance from New York uh, to Paris, which is in the middle. So there are definitely errors there. However, the visualization gave us some clue about how the data are being distributed and where the clusters are. And that's the, that's the benefit of the technique. Now I'm going to use a, a different technique, a nonlinear high dimensional visualization, which is the most popular tool that was developed like 10 years ago. So the book does not, doesn't, look, doesn't look like this. However, this technique has allowed me to see to find the clusters, the different uh, countries and the cities within the country. Say, the big area here on the bottom left is Europe. Then you have the US on the top left, and then you have South Africa, you have uh, uh, Brazil, and you have Japan on the bottom. So, and we can go a little more in detail to this. Uh, again, point proximity is it, on this map is point similarity, but within a cluster. So this technique, even though the world is definitely not this way, has helped me identify how the data are being distributed and uh, which city belongs to which country. Now, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to change the parameter in the high dimensional visualization. I'm going to say that cluster sensitivity is too high. It's set too high. So this way, I'm still able to identify the clusters at the high level, which is the, the countries, the big countries. But Europe has been Europe has been split into actually three different clusters, and that is Greece at the top. Then you have uh, <clears throat> you have the south of Europe, which is uh, uh, Italy, France, and then uh, and then uh, Spain, and then you have Northern Europe which is uh, the United Kingdom and, and uh, uh, in, in the middle. So by, uh, by changing different parameters in the high dimensional visualization, you can uncover structure at different scales. And that is what is so appealing with this nonlinear visualization technique. So let's start applying a couple of data sets before we start applying to, to our, uh, to our uh, transportation data. So this is a car data set. It has six variables there. So for each car, you have economy, number of citizens, cylinder displacement, power, weight, and zero to 60. So the question is, are some cars 
more similar to each other just based on their characteristics. So suppose that you just knew the characteristics of the cars, nothing else. Can you arrange the cars in clusters that are more similar to each other? So I'm going to use the high dimensional visualization to visualize the cars, and I'm just, but I'm just going to omit the cylinder variables, and uh, I'm just going to use the cylinder variables to color code the points. So if I use the high dimensional visualization technique to just visualize the cars on the plane, so each point becomes, so each car is a point. Each car is a point, okay. And uh, as I said, I'm using cylinders to color code the points. So you see that the uh, eight cylinder cars form a cluster on the right hand side. Then you have the uh, six and four cylinder cars uh, to the left. And on top of that, I also have plotted the K-means clustering algorithm, so I've calculated the clusters is a K-mean clusters algorithm. And then you see that the, the K-means is more or less consistent with the high dimensional visualization. Okay, so uh, another data set that is used in artificial intelligence a lot is a breast cancer data set, uh, which has about um, data for 569 uh, tumors. For each of these tumors, you have 30 attributes. The attributes include different geometric attributes. They could reduce texture, perimeter, area, smoothness, compactness, concavity. You have one more attribute, which is comes from a biopsy, whether the tumor is benign or not. So the question is, can the high dimensional visualization help you understand uh, the data a little bit more? So here is what the high dimensional visualization looks like. Each dot there is a tumor. It's a scan of a tumor that has 30 variables. Okay, 30 uh, uh, geometric variables that are related to like the size, the, the concavity, and all these parameters. Now, both visualizations were able to set, separate the two, uh, the two types of tumors. The nonlinear one was a little bit better. For the nonlinear one, you understand that you have two or three uh, groups of points there. So when you color code the points based on the biopsy, whether it's uh, benign or malignant, you see that the high dimensional visualization is able to separate, to say, to say to you that the points that have similar geometric characteristics uh, on the top right, these are the benign. And the other ones, which have uh, smaller dispersion, these are the, uh, the malignant. You can also see that a number of red points, which is the malignant, also are in the blue cluster. So these are, malignant two tumors that have very similar geometric characteristics with the benign ones. So for a researcher, this is a very good, I would say, uh, starting point to try to understand how these how this tumors look like. So let's start visualizing some of our data. So we'll start with heat maps. Uh, and I have a couple of applications. Uh, now, the first application is in Orlando, I have used NPM RDS data. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a corridor I focus to Orlando in the eastbound direction. So if I visualize the uh, heat maps on any given day, I get things something like that. Okay. The question is, can we use the high dimensional visualization to see if there is any structure into this, if there perhaps any sort of clusters? Uh, so if the high, in the high dimensional visualization, each point, each point of the plane is a, is a heat map, okay? So what the high dimensional visualization tries to do is like, if you were, you know, you had some time on your own and you printed each and every heat map, and you say, you know, I'm gonna arrange the heat maps that are similar to each other, and I'm gonna put them in, uh, say, one quarter, and the other heat maps that are arranged to, to another, um, heat maps that are, have other similarities, to another quarter, and you do this yourself, this is more, more or less the visualization we try to do. Now, I've printed the heat maps a little bit small, so we won't be able to uh, take a closer look at them. Uh, I'm doing, I mean, but I'm just gonna show you another heat map visualization that's a little bit easier for, uh, to actually do, to understand. So this is, uh, so this I-95 between DC and Baltimore. Again, we have heat maps. Uh, and then we visualize the heat map with, with high dimensional visualization and, and the result looks like this. Again, we have each form is a heat map. Now, we see that uh, furthermore, each point is being color coded by the average distance 
in the PMP, which is mean average speed in the PMP. So you see the points at the bottom uh, color from the blue. So these are uh, corridors that are very uh, uncongested. So all the speeds there are, uh, are close to 60 to 70 miles per hour. Uh, and then at the top, the points that correspond to, uh, to heat maps for which the speed is very, it's much lower, say between 20 and 30 miles per hour. So what is this, what is this triangle shows us? So when there is no congestion, the heat maps are very similar to each other, they're all blue. But as congestion increases, so does the dispersion uh, uh, of the heat maps. Okay? And the power of these visualizations actually is it's their means to an end. So they're not meant to, they're meant to uh, help you uncover the characteristics of the data. So you have to go into the, each of these points, see what is behind, and then try to understand um, how your data are being structured. So I'm just going to show you a couple more visualizations. So maybe I'm going through a little bit fast, but uh, let's see. Uh, so MTA station count. So that's an open, open data set. MTA in New York is publishing the turnstile count, turnstile count since 2010 uh, for a number of stations that they have. So this is very similar to you know, detector counts, all right? Uh, so for this application, we just aggregate the daily counts at the station, all right? And we have, for each day, each row in our data set is a day, and each column uh, represents uh, the, count, the daily counts of the particular station, all right? So if you do, if we uh, apply the high dimensional visualization, we get something like this, which tells us the following. Uh, so the data points there have been color coded by day of week. So you see uh, yellow is Sunday, uh, uh, red is Saturday. Also the, uh, the size of the circles corresponds to the total demand. So we see that Saturday and Sunday, they're more similar. So Saturday is similar to each other. The Saturdays, the demand on the Saturday, the demand patterns for Saturday are similar to each other. So the, we don't have any clusters for Saturdays and we don't have any clusters for Sundays. But for weekdays, there's a lot of disper dispersion, okay? So you have some weekdays that are, uh, that are days that are mixed together at the top, and then some other days, that, some other weekdays that form, say, a cluster with some Fridays at the bottom, okay? So this tells us there are definitely many demand patterns in the MTA system, okay? And further investigation is required to see whether those clusters correspond, say, uh, demand, higher demand in a northern section, southern section, what are the characteristics behind each of these clusters? So the benefit of this high dimension visualization is to give you the tools just to dig deeper into the data set and understand how it's being structured. Uh, taxi flows in New York City. So this is again a publicly available data set. Um, and uh, so that data set contains a row for each, set, for each and every trip. And it gives you the origin and destination zone of the trip. So if you aggregate this by day and neighborhood, then uh, you are you can uh, you can uh, and then visualize this in using a high dimensional visualization. You get something like this, okay, which may have some artistic value or not. I don't know, <laughs> but it definitely looks different. Uh, again, days different days have been color coded. Monday is light blue. Sunday is uh, is yellow. Uh, the data is highly clustered, highly clustered by neighborhood, okay? Uh, and also the points for each day, so each point here represents the outgoing flows from a particular neighborhood and day. Okay? So what does all this clustering mean? It means flows, taxi flows from any given neighborhood, they may vary on a daily basis but overall, they are very, very similar to each other, much more similar to the flows for that particular neighborhood than to the flows that any other neighborhood, okay? Uh, and what I have also done, I have just uh, calculated the context hole for each and every, um, for each and every uh, uh, neighborhood so that someone can see that for some points, you see that uh, they belong closer to the centroid of the neighborhood, some other points, uh, they are very similar to the flows from some other neighborhood. Um, 
And this I compare OT flows, taxi OT flows, that we don't have that much time to, to discuss. So um, I'll just finish with some insights from this application. So this is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as, 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 as far as I know, there are not that many high dimensional applications in our in the transportation field. So this is experimental. Um, I, I don't actually know how useful they are, um, but uh, I think it's their good starting point just to try to understand properties of our transportation system that we're not aware, okay? They have several, several disadvantages. They, it's not always possible to show all structure in a plane. Uh, what the result is, is not intuitive. So you have to understand, you have to know the underlying algorithms and how they operate in order to be able to, be able to interpret. Um, <clears throat> so, and definitely more research is required. The advantage is that they're really easy to apply. You can apply them without analyze this, analyze the, the data, the distributions in your data. And uh, they're good for hundreds and thousands of variables. So you can visualize hundreds and thousands of variables in the data. So that's about it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Sir, all in back there. Um, yeah, you said about the uses in our applications. It seems to me, and I've seen people do similar cluster analysis on um, truck weights and data, that, that there are a lot of applications having to do with quality assurance of data with clustering. Mm -hmm. In the examples, you didn't explicitly mention quality assurance of data, but is that something used in the other disciplines? Right, so, th so these, these techniques help you to visualize the data before you apply cluster analysis. So definitely you can use them with any type of data set that you, that you have, including quality and assurance. And just have a, some data set that, got, that describe the performance of the system, demand and supply. And that's why I, used, I, I, I applied it to, to those cases. But it can be applied to any type of data that you have. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that last question and let, let Katie jump up here so she can get her full time, but mm -hmm. I just want to uh, thank you for your presentation. Sure. Maybe you can 